turn it into a fuel producing microbe. If we imagine that glucose is going to be our new petroleum, we need a source for that glucose. And so the crops that we're looking at are crops like switchgrass. This is a native grass that grows without a lot of water and on marginal lands, but we could turn it into energy farms. The challenge, though, is that unlike sugarcane, it's very difficult to get the sugar out of that biomass. So we use what we call a pretreatment process to extract the glucose from the plant, and then we feed that glucose to a yeast that we've engineered to produce hydrocarbons. And that yeast takes in the sugar, and it changes its composition and gives us this high-energy molecule. They float to the top, you skim them off, you put them in your tank. but it takes a lot of work to get from that small test tube all the way up into the million gallon tank. So we have to give it time, but I think that some of the discoveries that are happening might be applied by the end of the decade. In terms of a sustainable equation for the planet, the role of biofuels is quite tricky. There are a variety of crops that do not compete directly with food, and finding ways to utilize those types of crops first, that's very attractive. So solving the science is part of the story, but then evaluating all of these new fuels in terms of the land use impacts that they could have, that is an even harder story than doing the good science. Imagine that you could have one process that could take in sunlight and carbon dioxide and turn it into fuel. And imagine if that didn't involve growing anything at all. The synthetic biologists are trying to take plants and make them do things that they wouldn't normally do. On the other hand, materials chemists like myself want to do artificial photosynthesis to improve on the process that nature does in real photosynthesis. We should follow the blueprint of plants converting sunlight into fuel, but take the approach that it could be much simpler. All we really need is a light absorber that absorbs sunlight. We also need a catalyst like iron or nickel. So when you see the hydrogen coming off of a photoactive material, that's an example of a semiconductor breaking the chemical bonds of water to make hydrogen and oxygen. Ultimately, our pieces are going to be contained in something that is easy to roll out like bubble wrap, where in would come sunlight and water. You would vent the oxygen to the air, but the bottom would wick out your liquid or gaseous fuel that then you could collect and use for our cars and planes and storage. Our goal is within two years to have the first artificial photosynthesis solar fuels generator that we can hold in our hands and then get to scale beyond that time. We're certainly not good at predicting the future, but to me, electric vehicles look like a sustainable option. We've heard proposals about things as far-fetched as nuclear power planes and even some proposals to move freight around with lighter than air vehicles. And so, if the future in 2050 does include a fair amount of oil, what it means would be that we haven't deployed as many of these clean technologies as we already know are possible. If you think about how long it's taken for us to build up the petroleum industry, we can't hope to reverse that overnight. It's a huge change in our infrastructure. Yes, we should have been working on it 30 years ago. We didn't. We're trying to make up for that, and that means basic research needs to be done now and by as many people as possible. We have a long way to go, but I'm confident that we'll get there. In the future, 3D maps are going to help people get places more efficiently.
As we just saw, the race to produce cleaner energy is charging ahead. In the meantime, demand for cars continues to climb. By 2050, it's predicted there'll be 2 billion cars on the planet, and fuel consumption will have tripled. To keep pace, we'll have to radically change the way we drive. Here's our next story, driven by design. The automobile came around. In many ways, it was the future. We thought of it as one of the more positive changes that had happened to society. Suddenly, our ability to get a job changed. We can live farther away with bigger plots of land, with better quality of living. It all looked quite good. But there are limitations to swearing by the car. If it gets congested, your quality of life drops immediately. To spend so long in the car, it's very inefficient use of fuel consumption. Things start making sense all of a sudden. It doesn't bring you closer to where you want to get. It actually uh, sometimes brings you farther. The average American spends nearly 300 hours a year in their car, 38 of them stuck in traffic. Annually, congestion consumes over $1 billion in gasoline in the United States alone. The inefficiency caused by traffic, both financial and personal, is enormous. Dirk Sheehan and Carmen White's story is not that unusual today. Dirk works an hour and a half away in Warrenville, Illinois. Generally, he wouldn't leave work until 6 or 6.30, and I would say a usual time for him to get home is around 8. Usually when I wake up, I'm the only one up. Sometimes the kids wake up with my routine. More often than that, I don't see them in the morning. I think about my commute when I wake up. I check the traffic report, see if there's any delays. The worst case scenario, it takes me two hours to get to work. We are already so limited in the amount of time he can spend with the kids. And our expenses are, are crazy high. We are spending 400 bucks a month on gas. It takes away from our food budget, and we never paid for gas like that before, ever. There's technology that would allow me to spend less time in the car, spend less money on gas, and spend more time at home. I'd be all for that. The cost of traffic is people's time. It's fuel wasted. It's an emotional toll. It's a frustration. Utilizing the roads more intelligently is a much more efficient approach to the inability to have supply keep up with traffic demand. If you took a satellite picture of the highway, you can see that there's actually a lot of open space. And if we had the technology for cars to drive more closely but safely, then you could increase the utilization of the road network. What this means is that to be more efficient, to use less fuel, we need to see the road differently. We need cars that can navigate through the urban landscape in a radically different way. Maps in the future are going to be able to help people get places either more safely or more efficiently. Today it just helps you get from point A to point B. But uh, what if I want to get someplace and use the least amount of fuel possible? Or if I've got a hybrid vehicle, I want to make sure I've got plenty of charge not only get there, but to get back home. So information that is going to help people achieve the more efficient or the safer route is more detailed information about the road than a lot of people realize is possible to collect today. Here in Chicago, Nokia's Location and Commerce Unit is developing the next generation of mapping. LiDAR, sonar, 360-degree video, all are components of what Nokia calls digital mapping. We use 64 lasers that rotate and they collect data in a 3D way uh, about the world. It creates what we call a point cloud of information. That point cloud allows us to measure distances then between uh, the points that we collect. That system combined with the cameras with higher precision location detection through inertial measurement units, that whole data system allows us to collect 1.3 million points of data per second. Probably within two to three years, you're going to see 3D maps that are going to integrate the traffic information into your routing to help you understand. If I've got five different routes to take, which one is the most efficient today, given the way the stoplights are running, given the way traffic is running? 
all of those factors are going to be taken into consideration 